so by now you know Dr. Kelly as the, I'm quoting here, the preeminent historian of Black popular culture, which is blurbed on all of his books by Dr. Cornell West and an interlocutor and proponent of black feminism and abolition feminisms. So I wanted to frame out my final introductory remarks with the focus on Robin's deep engagement in and with social movements and the modeling that he provides for radical intellectuals. In a time of so many crises and debate over the usefulness of crisis framings, what is the role of uh, the intellectual if there is a singular one? It is a longstanding question with Marxian inspired answers being firmly on the side of praxis, of the purpose of our work to change the world, which isn't as easy as it sounds. He's engaged these conversations directly um, on the pages of Boston Review, for example, with black student activists, or uh, just a couple of days ago in support of the tenure for Dr. Cornell West at Harvard. Um, yet this question of the intellectual is always broader than the academy. As we've seen over the past two days, Dr. Kelly looks to the visions and practices of organic, organic intellectuals in Gramsci's terms, that is or, uh, grassroots organizers, musicians, and others whose analyses reshape political thought and collective action. Robin is a teacher in and out of classrooms. He routinely reflects on learning political analysis through witnessing and being part of neighborhood and school-based activism as a child in New York City. Later in life in Los Angeles, as an undergraduate at Cal State Long Beach, he became a member of the Communist Workers Party after already having read Marx's work in high school, I think, uh, at least some of it. Um, study outside of the classroom was a part of the life of this party. Um, and he simultaneously did reading groups with other political for formations that were quite different than that one. Today, his books and essays are part of study groups such as Study and Struggle, which I mentioned yesterday, that have been convened to make sense of the present and find ways to organize in this moment of sustained movement against policing um, and for black liberation, as well as deepening right-wing resistance. So Robin has also been involved in international solidarity work and offers clear thinking on how to practice solidarity, which he refers to as world making. As a student organizer in the 1980s and later as a member of the Palestinian campaign of the academic and cultural boycott of Israel. Robin has worked to support Palestinian efforts for self-determination and has also written about black Palestinian solidarity. While a graduate student at UCLA, who is also involved in the anti-apartheid movement with regard to South Africa and part of a system-wide student coalition that succeeded in convincing the UC, the California regents to divest their $3.1 billion of holdings from South Africa and Namibia. This experience, I anticipate, informs some of the campaigns today in the UC system to abolish policing. So the scope of Robin's political involvement, again, being gestural, <laughs> is firmly present in his writing, informing intellectual and political questions within um, the text that we love, but also can be felt in the currents of political movements and the interrelationships forged across them in neighborhoods and public spaces shared in Los Angeles, Harlem, Cincinnati, or Cape Town. So once more, uh, uh, welcome, Dr. Kelly. Well, you did a lot of homework. <laughs> that, that's funny. I'm, I'm one of the few CWP, former CWP members um, in, in high places who still brags about that. <laughs> a lot of us can't afford to do that. Um, OK, so thank you so much. As always, um, I was, again, terrified as I since I'm co-host, I kept seeing all the names of the people coming in. And now I'm really terrified because some of my favorite people are here. Okay, let me just jump right in here. Um, and by the way, just um, one caveat. I, I don't have all the answers for anything. <laughs> I hardly have the answers to like how to find my keys. So, you know, just so you know, I'm gonna do the best I can and this is not so much a prediction of where we go, but like, you know, um, Patrick and I were talking at the beginning, it's really talking about strategy, but also especially where we've been and what we can learn from where we've been. Okay, so if you were among the throngs of people last spring, marching with signs held high, blocking traffic, 
of pushing past police, carrying placards, reading Black Lives Matter, justice for George Floyd, justice for Breonna Taylor, you might have thought we were winning. I mean, after all, you got 26 million people coming out and that's nothing to sneeze at. I mean, the Black Spring demonstrations were arguably the, the largest in US history. Um, and, you know, standing from where we are now, we might have forgotten you know, that the protests did force certain things. I mean, in my city, uh, Mayor Eric Garcetti um, cut funding to police by $150 million. There was cuts to police in Seattle, Denver, uh, uh, Denver Portland, and, and, and Oakland also um, eliminated school police. Uh, at least 16 cities pledged to significantly cut expenditures on law enforcement. Now, whether or not the, that money was transferred to something um, that was that we would, would be considered you know, like an improvement in people's lives, that's another story. Most of the times it wasn't. <clears throat> but what caught the attention of the press and liberals was the discernible presence of white people in the streets. But what really made these protests different, and I've said this elsewhere, uh, you know, from previous rebellions was that in, at its core, and I'm not saying all 26 million people, but at its core, there was signs of a, of a genuine abolitionist vision. Uh, the movement's calls to abolition, to abolish the police and prisons and to shift resources to housing, universal health care, living wage jobs, universal basic income, green energy, some kind of system of restorative or transformative justice that was all on the table, it was all spoken out loudly. Of course, most Americans were not down with this definition of abolition, uh, but the rebellion changed the temperature of the country in unique ways. Of course, uh, Petco, uh, Walmart, Starbucks, the monster sweatshop, Amazon were all claiming Black Lives Matter. Uh, publishers were falling all over themselves to sign up any author they could find uh, who wrote about race. Uh, though what sold did not reflect the radical politics on the streets. Rather, often um, there were primers on how to talk to white people about race or bloated books calling for radical empathy and asking white elites to voluntarily step out of their caste position and acknowledge the worthy Negroes of the talent intent. Um, and not necessarily about dismantling racial capitalism, though there are exceptions to the rule, but I'm talking about what sells. And then <clears throat> all this excitement, three months following this moment, cops killed Dijon Kizzy, Trayford Pellerin, Hassani Best, Anthony McLean, Kendra Antron Watkins, uh, Daniel Prude, and dozens and dozens of others. Jacob Blake was shot in the back point blank range in front of his kids. Kyle Rittenhouse killed two unarmed activists protesting the shooting of Blake and Trump declares him a hero. As more people died at the hands of police by lethal injection at the behest of the federal government in hospitals, in nursing homes, in city streets sick and without shelter we were instructed to stop this abolitionist nonsense and close ranks. We have to save democracy. We have to defeat Trump and his criminal lackeys. Um, stop all the talk about defunding the police. Hold your tongue on Kamala Harris's record as a prosecutor. Don't you know she's an AKA? Oh, or Joe, I beat the socialist Biden's hawkishness and unwavering support for police. And, and we did it. And I'm not trying to to um, disparage the important work that was required to get rid of Trump. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm all for that. And we succeeded. And Biden-Harris won. And Biden-Harris won with the largest vote total in history. Trump lost with the second largest vote total in history. Uh, mission accomplished, liberal democracy restored. Now, of course, in my super liberal state of California, some of the same folks who voted for Biden also defeated affirmative action, defeated rent control, and defeated um, the right of gig workers to have protections from um, labor law. But we saved democracy, <laughs> right? Right. So in Biden's own words, America is back. And boy, is it ever. So he picks Tony Blinken as Secretary of State and vowed 
he will continue, who, who vowed, I should say, uh, will continue to recognize Juan Guaido as the president of Venezuela rather than the democratically elected president, Nicolas Maduro. Um, and he promised to continue to impose harsh sanctions, which have crippled the Venezuelan economy. And America is back. We've got General, General Lloyd Austin, first black secretary of defense. Okay, so he's a civilian. Uh, he's not a civilian rather, in a civilian position, but, and he's also a show for Raytheon, uh, but he's black and hooray. Uh, we've got Avril Haines, director of national intelligence, one of the architects of Obama's drone strike policy and a player in uh, covering up torture during the George W. Bush administration. But she is a woman in the job, so hooray for feminism. Then, as we all know, on January 6th of this year, as Congress was doing its business of certifying the election, um, the fascist March to Save America, organized officially by the group Women for America First, turned into an outright fascist insurrection on the Capitol, organized by the Proud Boys Oath Keepers, which was founded um, by Stuart Rhodes, who was a military veteran and a Yale Law School graduate, remember that. The Boogaloo Boys, Sons of the Last Sons of Liberty, the Groyper Army, uh, former members of Rise Above Movement uh, and Anticom. And just to be clear, you know, just could have, in brackets, I mean, this was not a white working class operation. The social basis of the attack on the Capitol consisted of off-duty cops, active military and veterans, uh, and is very similar to the makeup of the third Ku Klux Klan and the American Nazi party. Uh, the middle class entrepreneurs and small business owners uh, also were participants in this insurrection, similar to the makeup of the second Klan. The, insurre the insurrection caught much of the country off guard. In fact, media outlets scrambled to find historians uh, to put these quote unquote unprecedented events in context. Um, and they called, they called, in fact, half the people on this call, <laughs> like, <laughs> I could see in, in, um, in, this, in, in this conversation, we'll probably call to sort of put these, put the insurrection in context. Um, it's been called our Weimar moment. It's been called America's crystal knot. Pundits comment, commented disparagingly that this kind of thing happens in a quote, banana republic, not America. Now, of course, for anyone vaguely aware of the history of American imperialism, the banana republic epithet is kind of hilarious since banana republics are made in the USA. But it's also important to remember um, that around the world, the capital insurrection was also seen as a classic case of the chickens coming home to roost, expressed in a statement issued by the Republic of Venezuela that, quote, the United States is experiencing what it has generated in other countries with its policies of aggression. Now for this sort of new abolitionist uh, movement, one that um, I kind of argue, I didn't talk about this at all, but uh, in, in the book, if I ever finish it, really has its roots um, in the 1990s, probably a little bit before that. Uh, but this new abolitionist movement, for them, the insurrection was predictable and not because it had been advertised for weeks, though that's another, <laughs> that's another story. Um, in fact, uh, four years ago, I wrote an article uh, about Trump's election in the Boston Review and I wrote, Today's organized protests in the streets and other places of public assembly portend the rise of a police state in the United States. For the past five years, the insurgencies of the movement for black lives and dozens of allied organizations have warned the country that unless we end racist state sanctioned violence and the mass caging of black and brown people, we are headed for a fascist state. So the January 6th insurrection was led um, by the very same forces that many of us were fighting in the streets during Black Spring. But then again, we were fighting fascism in Charlottesville, in Charleston, at Standing Rock, in Ferguson, in Baltimore, in Florida, from Sanford to Jacksonville to Liberty City. 
I mean, we were fighting fascism in China Grove, in Greensboro, North Carolina in 1979, in Wilmington in 1898, in Bensonhurst, in Stonewall, uh, in Birmingham, in Selma, uh, in Albany, Georgia, all throughout Mississippi, in Brownsville and Rosewood, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in East St. Louis, in Watts, Detroit, Newark, Chicago, in every ghetto, burial, and reservation in this country. We were fighting fascism at Sand Creek, at Skeleton Cave, at Fort Robinson, at Wounded Knee in 1890 and again in 1973. We were fighting fascism in West Virginia's coal mines, in Ludlow, Colorado, in Springfield, Illinois, at Republic Steel in Chicago, at the, the River Rouge plant uh, in Dearborn, in California's Central Valley, on the Southwest border, and today in Bessemer, Alabama. I mean, we were fighting fascism in Attica, in Soledad, San Quentin, in the internment camp in Manzanar, in the immigration detention facilities in Clint and McAllen, Texas. I mean, we fight fascism when we demand no more cages. We fight fascism when we demand the immediate release and medical care for Mumia Abu-Jamal, Sundiata Akoli, uh, Jam Jamil Amin, Leonard Peltier, Russell Maroon Schultz, Veranza Bowers, Ed Poindexter, Jalil Muntakim, and Dr. Matula Shakur. We fight fascism when we fight policies of forced sterilization. We fight uh, for, when we fight for reproductive freedom. I mean, we fight fascism when we fight mass student expulsions and suspensions, uh, when we fight these children's prisons uh, that pass off as schools. Actually, my talk is really short. Um, and just in conclusion, um, 21st century abolition is not the same as 19th century abolition. I just wanna make this clear. There's a way that sometimes they get collapsed. Uh, 19th century abolition wasn't necessarily anti-capitalist um, and it certainly wasn't necessarily anti-cages. And that's another conversation we can have. But 21st abolition is something different. And I take my lead from uh, people like, you know, Maram Kaba, uh, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, Angela Davis, Dean Spade. I mean, uh, there's so many names I can name. Um, and if we take their lead, then we have to recognize that 21st, abo 21st century abolition is dedicated to eradicating all forms of oppression and exploitation, ending state sanctioned violence, replacing police, military, and prisons with genuine, humane, non carceral paths for safety and justice freeing the body from the constraints of inherited and imposed normativities, protecting the earth and ending all forms of precarity. And so to the question I get from all my comrades on the left, um, is abolition anti-capitalist? And it's an important question uh, since it seems that the phrase abolitionist has displaced in some respects the phrase socialist uh, which was, you know, as a lingo of uh, revolution, though I still use socialist, I'm, I'm still for socialism. Um, and we could talk about that as well. But my answer to the question is always the same. If it is not anti-capitalist, it is not dedicated to the elimination of all forms of oppression and exploitation everywhere. If it is not anti-capitalist, it is not genuinely abolitionist. And we need to be clear about this because trust me, it won't be long uh, before Cadillac, Target, Google, and Amazon uh, come out with their own slick, inspiring, we're abolitionist ad campaign. So look for that. Anyway, that's what I wanted to, to throw out as a kind of provocation and use the rest of the time just to have an open discussion about the larger question, which I can't um, answer, and that is, uh, what's next? You know, the answer to what's next, of course, uh, rests with, with all of us. Um, but it is a struggle because again, to go back to that moment where we, where many of us thought with 26 million people in the streets, things have got to change. Um, and what, we, what ended up happening was a kind of consolidation of um, even more white supremacist violence 
against that. That's not a new phenomenon. This is something we've seen. Um, but still, what's next? And finally, just one last thought, um, which I didn't prepare to think about, but you know, one of the one of the arguments I make, you know, over and over again uh, in this book I'm trying to write, and I've been making it for 25, 30 years, is that some of the most radical um, insurgencies that really have fought for kind of significant social justice and change have not been necessarily directed at conservative um, reactionary uh, regimes in the United States, but those who claim to be liberal, um, the Johnson administration, Clinton. Um, I mean, the, so much of the movement that we that that converged in spring of 2020 uh, had its roots in the struggles against the Obama administration. So here we are about to enter another moment of liberal multicultural um, nirvana. Um, and what we get are, you know, military strikes in Syria uh, and other things. So what are we going to do? And what is it going to look like? I suspect that what we'll see now uh, in the coming years uh, will be probably as powerful uh, and significant as anything that happened uh, in spring of 2020. It just may not look like with, it may not look like 26 million people. That's all I'm saying. Um, okay, so that's kind of a strange conclusion. Uh, so let's uh, open up and have a <coughs> conversation. Thank you. All right. Well, um, you've all been provoked. So this is your opportunity. We've got an hour to have a conversation. Um, and what I so I'm going to tell you what to do is that you can go to the bottom of your panel, your screen, and you can click on participants where you you can um, indicate that you want to raise your hand. That'll alert me. And I will keep a queue, a, a stack of people that will um, that I'll call on. The other way to ask a question is in the chat, which is immediately to the right of participants. So I already have somebody, but again, do that and I'll keep track of it. And the first person actually is somebody who was the last person on the first day whom I didn't get to. So that's kind of appropriate, Ria. And if you can activate your camera and microphone, that would be great. Yes, of course. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Um, I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you for such an insightful series for the last three days. I was just going to ask, on the first day you mentioned that in order to get to social change, reversing harm and the conditions that create it lead to transformative change. So how can we, since most of us here are students, how can we as students engage with active practices of abolition and systemic change and kind of transition with from talking about change to engaging with change? Like what can we do as students in our communities to kind of work towards making better condition, systemic conditions? So by students in your community, I just wanna make sure I understand which communities are you talking about? As student communities or just communities who you come from or all communities? I think kind of both. So I know like currently I'm a student at Madison, but I'm personally from the suburbs of Chicago. Mm -hmm. So I guess kind of based on the events that took place in spring of 2020 and based on kind of this discussion we've been having the last three days, what are ways that like as young people we can kind of engage with whether it's stuff in Madison or just in general local groups or coalitions towards working towards creating better change and not just advocating for, but actively working towards improving conditions that cause oppression and suffering. Right, right. Well, you know, I, I actually think, um, to go back to the very last thing you said, advocating for and improving conditions, those two things are inseparable. And sometimes we underestimate um, how important it is to do essentially political education around some, some of these questions. Um, and, and by that, and let me just say one other thing before I get to the heart of the question. I mean, in thinking about where, what to do, of course, um, my, my, my mom named me Robin Davis Gibran Kelly. She did not name me Robin Davis Sage Kelly. So I don't even know, <laughs> like I can't even tell you uh, exactly what I can tell you is who I learned from. And I think it's important for students, for people to actually come together and actually talk and read together um, I mean, it's one thing to be in the streets and doing things. I'm not saying don't do that, but sometimes we don't 
talk and be together, to be able to figure these things out together, to think together in collective. Um, instead, we, we get these kinds of forms where, you know, someone's up there and then they get to ask the question what to do. Well, you can ask that question, but in reading together, there's some things I think you should definitely check out. Um, I, am, I am thrilled that uh, Maram Kaba's uh, collection of, of essays has come out with Haymarket is called um, "We uh, We Do This uh, Till We Till We Free." Um, beautiful essays. Every one of those essays, some are co-authored with other people, um, actually answered a lot of the questions um, about what we can do and where the struggles are. Uh, that's one thing, and that's just one. I mean, I think about Dean Spade just came up with this amazing book, Mutual Aid, uh, which shows you not only um, what we need to do, but how we need to do it. And that sometimes the how we do it is part of making revolutionary changes within ourselves and creating conditions for, uh, uh, for, um, for actually protecting ourselves from the kind of well, state violence and other forms of violence that we, have, that we endure in doing this work, but also laying out the foundations for the kind of uh, uh, world we can create where we reduce the harm or at least deal with harm in a way that people are held accountable and take care of each other. You know, because being able to take care of each other and think together, that's just such a huge step. You know, we, we, we're defeated all the time because we get placed in isolation, you know, and the pandemic has actually in some ways put a magnifying glass on what does it mean to be isolated um, as opposed to being in struggle together, you know? Uh, so those are things, but then again, there's two other things I could think about that are more general, but not very specific because everyone has their specific issues. But the more general thing is, you know, to always think about whatever local and immediate things that are that you're up against, to think about them in the context of the world. You know, um, there, there's a way in which all the anti-Trump organizing and 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 um, hand wringing and all the crisis stuff has taken the question of, of US militarism and foreign policy kind of off the table. Not entirely, not for everyone, um, but there's a way in which we're so we're all kind of struggling with what's in front of us that we forget that what's in front of us is connected to what's happening around, around the world right now. Uh, and you know, Trump was able to get away with a lot with his America first uh, stuff and claiming that, you know, is it going to end all these wars and whatnot. Uh, and, and even some things that were actually kind of good, like saying, you know, we need to end the war in, in between North and South Korea. I mean, that's not a bad thing, right? However, we're now dealing with like, like the same intense militarism that we've been dealing with my whole life. And I'm old. Look, I'm, I'm older than, the, than <laughs> I'm older than Tony Blinken by a month, you know? So, I mean, we've been dealing with this for a long time. So making those kinds of connections between our communities, our immediate um, space, and then the rest of the world's important. And finally, I would say, um, you know, you're at a university and this is something we've been, uh, a lot of us have been writing about long, for a long time. Universities are corporations, universities, even state universities. And there are a lot of things, a lot of fights to be had. We're having a fight right now at UCLA and throughout UC, UC Pro, without, uh, throughout UC, University of California, uh, the same fights going on at University of Chicago and elsewhere of trying to get cops off campus, you know, trying to make our campuses safer, trying to make sure that uh, physical plant workers and uh, uh, food service workers and, and so-called um, the so-called essential workers who basically do gardening and stuff on campus to make it look pretty um, are protected and don't have to work for, for, for meager wages uh, in a pandemic. I mean, there's a lot of things that go that goes on in universities that a lot of students are not aware of because it's kept from you, you know. Um, you end up coming in as consumers because you pay all this money, 
even at state universities. So these are all fights worth having. They're all fights worth having. Um, so I know it's a lot, <laughs> but we got time, right? Anyway, but, but good luck. Hope that's helpful. All right, we've got several people now who are in the, in the stack. So one of them um, is in the chat. So Emma says, so many of the tipping points of recent rebellions for Black Lives have been in Midwestern small cities, Ferguson, Minneapolis, Kenosha, and thousands of not widely recognized enough marches have taken place in small towns, including almost unthinkably my tiny town of Mauston, Wisconsin, population 3000. Do you have thoughts on models and lessons that black radical struggle uprising in the C19, I guess that's 19th century and 20th century offer for busting through the false and racialized divide between rural and urban working class, poor BIPOC people? Thank you. Right, that's a great question. First of all, historically, um, uh, you're right about that uh, in terms of small and middle-sized cities and, and I have to say, um, Elizabeth Hinton has this great book that's about to come out, which looks at, um, kind of revisits the Kerner uh, Commission reports, but revisits all those rebellions in 1967 and after, and really shows that so many of them were in places like York, Pennsylvania, you know, um, in, in places, I mean, all over uh, the country. Cincinnati, was, I began my, my series of lectures with Cincinnati, which is a very important, it's a city, but it's not like a huge, large city that we think of. Cincinnati is, is a city of the South. It's across the river from Kentucky and it is very Southern. Um, so that's one thing. Um, the other thing uh, I think is just to be clear, some of these places, like Ferguson, for example, um, we think of Ferguson as a small, as a town, but it's really a suburb of St. Louis. Uh, in, and when you look at the, 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 the urban planning of a place like St. Louis in North County, um, so many of these little bedroom communities were created for white people to get away from, <laughs> get away from people of color. Um, and, but then they couldn't keep it, they couldn't hold on to it. Um, and so sometimes what we see are like Illinois, for example, places outside of Chicago, um, places that were not necessarily intended to be black communities that became such or become transitional spaces. And so to understand why these, why these, why the tipping point, the tipping point is in these places, is also un to understand the history of urban planning and the kind of racial geographies that a lot of people at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, which has a great geography department, is doing that kind of work. Um, uh, in terms of finally the last thing, which is the kind of urban and rural, um, we've we've got to we've got to pay a lot of attention to struggles in rural areas, um, not just like farm workers, though that matters, it matters a lot. It matters in California, it matters in Georgia, it matters, you know, in Mississippi. Um, but if you take, for example, you know, California, and if you look at Ruth Wilson Gilmore's classic Golden Gulag, uh, what you see is a relationship between rural areas, um, uh, real estate capital, surplus land and what to do with it in the prison industrial complex and, and, and what funds it. And so there's something about studying geography and studying scale and studying the way capital flows that helps us understand what's not always evident by just looking at people fighting, fighting repression of police. You look at how people got to where they are. You look at, you realize that even in the history of America, I mean, in the United States, you know, some the, the places where capital was concentrated often wasn't the cities of Philadelphia and New York or LA, but the Mississippi Valley, Valley you know, um, or New Orleans, um, places where, you know, it may look like a backwater, but this is the, the opening mouth of, of the cotton trade to the rest of the world. And Walter Johnson's um, amazing book, 
um, River of Dark Dreams lays this out as well. So I think, you know, to, to ask, to answer the question is to sort of figure out how people got to where they are in this relationship to capital and to racism. Um, you know, and that will help understand like wh where these spaces are of, of potential explosion. Um, I don't think there's a place uh, where there are not people who are oppressed that's not a place of potential explosion, you know, not in this country. All right, so our next person is Donna Murch. Donna's already got her camera activated. If you could unmute yourself, Donna, go ahead. Hey, Dan, hey, Donna. Hi, Robin. Thank you for your brilliant, brilliant lectures. They've been so inspiring. So I have a question that relates to something you've been talking about, which is that, you know, at Rutgers, we've had very, very brutal austerity with 5% of our workforce being fired and the most vulnerable parts of the workforce, both PTLs, but then dining hall workers, you know, people from AFSCME, AFSCME and service unions. So we've We've, our union has undergone a transformation and we're, we have a coalition with 19 unions and 20,000 people and we're trying to fight like that. And I wanted to hear more about your idea about solidarity as world making. And I was thinking about also the, the struggle in Bessemer, which is truly inspiring. So kind of that convergence because the pandemic has been devastating, but I think it is also, especially in public sector unions, it has created these opportunities for organizing and for solidarity. And, you know, we look to UTLA and CTU, you know, for our inspiration. So I was interested just at that nexus between abolition and this labor movement. Right, right. Um, yeah, I, I, wish, I wish I could take um, credit for, <laughs> for solidarity as world making um, because I can't. And I just wanna, um, before I, Kind of answer the question. Um, I think about. Um, uh, um, I'm looking for something here, as a note. I'm trying to find. Um, hold on one second. Yeah. So. I I, I wrote that. The, the, I wrote the the, the title at Solidarity of Role Making was about this piece I did about Palestine and Black liberation. And of course, I take that from Adam Gedichu's amazing book, amazing book. Um, and, and that was the lesson uh, I took from, from her work. Uh, as far as its relationship to what's going on at Rutgers, first of all, I mean, the fact that you even have a union <laughs> And that's amazing. I, I mean, I, I'm at a state university, UCLA, where you, you can't, if you tried hard, you couldn't get faculty to unionize at this place. Cal State system is different. Um, so the fact that you are even building solidarity that connects faculty with workers, that itself is like a huge advance. Um, and that's incredibly exciting. Um, but as far as like, you know, trying to make a connection there, you know, um, the, the, the Amazon workers in Bessemer, to me, and this is where the, the light should be shined, like right now, um, this is really where we should be focused in terms of understanding what the future might look like, uh, the, the immediate future in terms of the struggle. It reminds us that unions are not dead, unions are, very much have to come back. Um, it reminds us that um, the solidarity that was built around Amazon, the Amazon workers, started off with poultry workers, the, the, our, our, uh, the, un the poultry workers union, basically. I mean, they're the ones you know, organizing these black workers uh, at Amazon. Uh, and, and of course, Bessemer will probably be the first to unionize if they don't, if, if Bezos's people don't come up with a company union to replace it, but but think about like what is Amazon if not like the uh, global um, uh, corporate you know example of the of the worst aspects of global capital? I mean, Amazon touches everywhere, and if we think of 
the solidarity that's required to support and build the struggle in Bessemer as a national thing or as just something that you know we basically give money to the union, then we, we actually don't see the way in which solidarity could be world-making. And the way to do that is to recognize that what's happening in Bessemer is a global struggle. And that means that we have to do more than just send money to the union and talk about it and write about it. Uh, we have to basically figure out ways to boycott Amazon, to bring down those corporations, to provide, you know, just like Palestine, uh, around the question of boycott, just like South Africa around the question of boycott, um, just like um, Harvard. <laughs> we, we've got to figure out ways as, as people, as consumers, as critics, as activists to participate at, and see this as these global struggles. And Rutgers University um, is an interesting place. You know, it's got a, a, a new president who I, I think is great. Uh, it's got, got a lot of potential. Um, there, but like any university, it has this corporate um, aspect and it has a, um, a, a, it's required in many ways to generate revenue. And so as workers, we've got to figure out a way uh, so that the generation of revenue is not exploitative, you know, for, for everyone else. And you're all aware ahead of that, but um, I'm not sure if that, that helps, but, um, but you know the answer better than me, having written like the book on the Black Panther Party <laughs> in Oakland, which talk about solidarity's world making. I mean, you know, thinking about the Black Panther Party in your question and thinking about this uh, incredible uh, film by Shaka King uh, on um, Fred Hampton, you know, it's a reminder that, you know, the movements that seem to have had the greatest footprint, the greatest impact with the ones that have connections to the rest of the world, whether it's the Vietnam or Algeria, right? Um, and so, you know, these are the things that I think we have to always keep in mind. It goes back to my response to the earlier question about um, always remembering that we live in the world. Uh, you know, we, we talk about abolition a lot, we use that term. And I think, and I can't speak for everyone, I speak for myself that, that you know, a, a really truly abolitionist vision is a no border vision. Um, and a no border vision is not possible without internationalism, without solidarity, you know, um, uh, but also recognizing that solidarity uh, may be world making, but it's also really hard work. And sometimes it means um, building alliances uh, with people in movements who may not totally agree with every single thing you do. Um, but those alliances are probably necessary, even if you're honest about entering into them. Um, and and it, it also means that sometimes the process of working together can be transformative. So that the things that you may not agree with at the, at the beginning, you may come to some sense of a consensus at, a, at the other point, the other end of it. So anyway, but thank you so much, Don. It's so great to see you. Thank you so much. Okay, our next question's co question comes from Isha. Isha, if you can turn on your camera and microphone. Sure. Can everyone hear me? Okay, hey, perfect. How you doing? Um, hello, my name is Aisha. I'm a fourth year student here at UW-Madison um, and I'm working in human development and family studies. Um, thank you so much for this whole weekend. I wasn't able to come yesterday, but Tuesday and today, even if it was for such a short period was like so wholesome. I wrote so many things <laughs> down that you said. Um, and I think what I wanted to know um, one, because like, I hope to be um, like an art curator that like curates programs for adolescents mm -hmm. um, and fights for like art programs to be kept in schools versus like that being the first thing cut out of budgeting. Um, yeah. What I think something that I was hope um, would like, like you to shed light on is like in a lot of the spaces that I've been in at UW-Madison um, and being in conversation with like students from all over, I've gotten <laughs> to practice a lot of patience and meet people where they're at when we're in discussion. But sometimes I think 
a lot of people's posture, tone, and language would not like to meet me where I'm at um, with the identities that a lot of times I enter in space and let people know that like I hold these to be very salient to me as like a Black Muslim woman, um, as somebody from Minneapolis, like lower income, like I'm very blunt about those identities that I have and like I'm very unwilling to move in those identities because they're the shapings of my person. So I, my question is like, what are ways that like you hold grace in your body and um, kind of extend grace to either individuals or like when we're in a community setting where we're like, okay, yes, we're trying to build or we're trying to reimagine or we're trying to unlearn or relearn um, like certain things that the society says like, oh, this has to be the norm and this is how, how you have to live. I think I'm, I would like to be like, oh, I'm the most graceful person now. Nah, nah. But sometimes I feel like I lack in that or may, maybe don't have the necessary language. So I'm, if, if you have an answer for that, like how do we extend grace in those like tougher conversations or the conversations that people are having for the first time that I've had to have for like the 500th time, right. you know? patience basically oh isha uh that that's that's a beautiful important i'm got i got tears actually because it's a beautiful and important question it is an essential question um it's a hard question and the best way i could try to answer it is by sharing a story uh that uh the great poet aja monet uh shared with me um and she was talking about uh, being at um, uh, a meeting. You know, we have a lot of, I mean, be, being involved with groups like, you know, Dream Defenders, Movement for Black Lives, and others, we, you know, have these, um, these kind of gatherings, you know, and there's spaces to really deal with hard things and struggle and strategize. And, and so at this one meeting, um, there was an older brother who had been in the movement for a very long time, and I believe, if I'm correctly, formerly incarcerated. And, um, you know, I think that's right, but if not, it doesn't really matter. It's basically a brother, veteran of the movement, who had, mis had misgendered somebody. And didn't realize it and you know and it caused a whole lot of struggle I mean it's like you know you can't do that and you know that's unacceptable you know you need to apologize and he said um look I am so sorry I didn't mean to do that at all I said I'm learning but I'll take a bullet for you. All right, so you think about grace and how much we have to sacrifice even when we lose. But he said, look, I'll take a bullet for you. I said, I may not know everything or know how to talk, but I'll take a bullet for you. And knowing that, it's kind of like solidarity is hard. And I've been criticized lots of times because it's like I defend white people, you know, white working class people, you know, but I wrote a book about a movement where, you know, they were black people recruiting members of the Klan into the Communist Party, you know, and had to teach them you can't use the N word in here, you know, so it's hard, it doesn't, it doesn't make it easier. But all I know is that I have to give everybody I meet the benefit of the doubt and that there's a learning process. And so if people can't see you as a Muslim woman, as a, a black woman, you know, as a person, and it's not your responsibility to, con to make them see you, um, but it's really our responsibility, all, all of us around you, to help make them see you. And if someone's silent, 
in that space and doesn't stand up, then they're not helping. You know, even if they come back to you later, said that's so jacked up, you know, that they're not helping. So it's really, it's, it's, you know, and so it's beautiful to go back to the Aja Monet stories that the whole group stop what they're doing and say, we need to rethink how we, how we talk to each other. We need to rethink our relationships and, and like, and how do we move people? Because it's one thing to meet people where they are. It's another thing to move them because when you move them, you move too, right? And that's what, it, that's what it takes, you know? And it's not easy because look, you live in a Islamophobic racist world <laughs> and misogynist world, you know? So your, your, your very presence is a challenge, but your presence is also the future. So I appreciate you and I'll follow you anywhere. And I'll take a bullet for you. All right. Okay, we have a question from Tiona who asks, thinking of the South, specifically the water crisis happening in Jackson, Mississippi, mm. can you speak more to the connections between ecology, abolitionism, and anti-capitalism? <clears throat> um, well, that's the answer to the question right there. Ecology, abolitionism, anti-capitalism, they're inseparable. Um, uh, let me say specifically about Jackson. My sister lives in Jackson and um, uh, she's, she, we were talking recently uh, about the water crisis. She had her water just turned back on. And the fact that the infrastructure um, looks like it's gonna cost about a billion dollars to fix. Um, but what she says, her argument is that it doesn't have to cost a billion dollars to fix. It'll cost a billion dollars to fix under the current system of contracting and the way in which um, the contracts for infrastructure are done, which is not necessarily ecologically friendly, not necessarily really progressive, and not really sort of uh, advance our thinking about um, the water grid or the electric grid or whatever it is it, it's required. And so she's like, this is an opportunity to completely rethink the way, um, you know, instead of repairing an old system, to, to think of a new system and to think of one that's ecologically friendly but see this is where you know you can't we can't have the end of all forms of oppression and exploitation if um, we can't get access to clean drinking water uh, to you know energy that's not going to destroy us uh, to um, clean air and and to to maintain life all around so these things are really, really inseparable. Um, all of our struggles against fracking and pipelines, which have really been at the centerpiece of so much of the anti-fascist work I was trying to talk about, um, not just uh, in Standing Rock, but in Virginia for, for, for that matter, in other places, um, those kinds of struggles um, do sort of three things. Uh, one, they uh, remind us of that our struggle is about the restoration um, of the earth to its original inhabitants. That is to think about sovereignty as a way to protect the planet. The second thing that those struggles do as abolitionist struggles um, is it, 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 it pushes back against um, what drives these projects. That is profit-making. Um, that's why we have fracking in um, pipelines and a crumbling infrastructure, that we've got to really decide that um, uh, profit-making, the capital, uh, will not determine our future, even in the short run, uh, which reminds me of one little side story, is someone had mentioned to me that, you know, when we, back in, uh, a couple of years ago, we had all those storms and electrical grids were growing out, uh, like just not working. The places that had municipally owned uh, electrical companies or grids were the ones that were able to sustain in Connecticut, sustain themselves in the face of blackouts. I mean, so that's sort of the third part of it is that, you know, again, to push back against uh, profit-making is also to make certain claims 
uh, to collectively owned and operated, you know, um, systems of, 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 of energy, you know, and, and I think that's really, really important to think about that, to think about the relationship between um, owning like a, a, a town or a city uh, having its own electrical grid rather than have it privatized to push back against privatization of everything. Um, it's very hard to think about that in the 21st century when privatization has been like the, the key word for the way the kind of neoliberal turn has kind of gone. Um, and we saw the, the devastating impact uh, of what happens when capitalism, a war on the environment and, and climate, uh, racism, uh, you know, and the kind of carceral state has had an impact on that, on New Orleans after Katrina, where it was displacement of people uh, followed by privatization of everything from schools to hospitals uh, to, um, to actually continuing the environmentally destructive practices of, you know, opening up um, uh, the, the water system for big tankers, which is destroying the environment and making storms even worse, as, as Claude Woods talks about uh, in, in his, in, in his uh, last book. Um, so th this is the fight we have to have. Um, but it's very hard, you, but these things are inseparable as is implied in your question. Okay, we have another question in the, in the chat, which comes from CJ, who asks, given on the one hand, the many roles needed in this movement and at this moment, but also the dangers of co-optation and quote unquote trend, how would you define activist? How would I define activist? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I guess I hadn't really thought about that only because I don't always use activist. Sometimes I use organizer. Um, uh, but let me let me go back to the the implication of the question. You know, and this came up yesterday too. Uh, we should expect co-optation. Um, we should not expect not co-optation. <laughs> Why? Because. Um, as Walter Rodney has said many times, um, you know, we're, we're not, we're not, we're fighting an enemy, an enemy that puts a lot of resources into destroying our movements. Um, and so co-optation comes with the territory. Co-optation is way more successful, as Antonio Gramsci would tell us, than just outright brute force. Um, and that happens. Um, we see co-optation right now in part of my little talk at the beginning um, with respect to, you know, investing all this energy in making sure that Biden and Harris are elected. And what does it mean uh, when some of the activists who were um, really frontline fighters uh, end up, you know, basically inside or supportive of or connected to the Biden-Harris administration. Um, that's gonna be interesting to see what happens, you know? Um, and that's an old, it's an old story. It's a very, very old story. Uh, you know, as far as, um, you know, how do you, uh, how do I define activists in that context? Um, I would say an activist, generally speaking, is someone who's willing to actually do something more uh, to make some kind of change happen. An activist, not necessarily progressive activists. I mean, those, those people who stormed the Capitol were, were activists for fascism, you know? Um, so act, that's basically activists. I mean, uh, an organizer is someone who's also some, who's an activist, but is who does the work of organization, uh, which is the hard work of developing strategy, um, the hard work of bringing people together, the hard work of making sure things that are, people are cared for and things happen. But organizers are never alone. The best organizers are surrounded by other organizers. The best organizers are the organizers who train organizers um, so that we're all organizers. 
Um, and that to me is, is much more important, but you know, we should expect um, to be derailed and undermined and surveilled. Uh, and we should expect to have a lot of us see shiny objects and go after them because it has, happens all the time. But the final thing I say, I, Fred, Fred Moat and I talk about this all the time. When you look at the history in the United States, let alone most places, but the United States, um, say the civil rights movement, for example, or even kind of radical feminist movements, these were never mass movements. The movement in Mississippi was never a mass movement. The movement in Alabama was never a mass movement. I mean, the March on Washington was not necessarily representative of the actual movement itself, which was a handful of organizers in places like Sunflower County, you know, um, uh, Mississippi, and places like Lowndes County, Alabama. They were the ones that got out there and did the work. So you, so you know, those are the things that have moved us in the past, um, and that's different, I think, from this idea that you know the 26 million people who came out uh, in Black Spring were the movement. You know. Um, and the more people build movements and the more organizers become really smart about it, they have to make decisions. And those decisions often are ones that protect them from co-optation, that protect them from um, agent provocateurs, that protect them from surveillance. Uh, and that's the, best, that's the best we can all do, you know, to fight that fight, if that helps. All right. We have a question from Tanisha. Tanisha, if you can turn on your camera and microphone, please. Hey, um, Mr. Kelly, here again. Hi, Tanisha. <laughs> Hi, Tanisha from New York City. And it's um, crazy that um, somebody asked about a act, um, what's, the, what's the activist. Um, right now in New York City, my activism is mostly um, dedicated to the children, mm -hmm. to Black and Brown children that have never had an equitable fully funded, um, socially, emotional, um, culturally responsive education and curriculum. Um, as most people know, our education is very whitewashed and yes. all the things and all the, the black people and the, the great things that black people have contributed to this um, country is always left out. So um, during the pandemic, um, I seen another divide with technology. Mm -hmm. Um, I watched the Department of Education spend millions of dollars on inadequate iPads that are tracked, that are restricted, and that hardly work. And, you know, I see how they take the power away from our children, how they um, make our children think that they don't have any power as, as students. It starts in school, you know, because when you don't see yourself and what you're learning, you think that white mm -hmm. people did everything. Right. So um, being an activist, I had to do something. So I started a GoFundMe in September and I've raised over $65,000. And so far I have brought over a hundred children, eight gigabyte HP touchscreen laptops that belong to them with no strings attached. Um, my question is, is now um, I have gotten some, uh, uh, national attention because CBS did a story on us. Okay. My question, but I had to work hard. You know, right, right. I mean, that's the thing about being a black woman, right. um, a black activist, a black organizer. I have to fight for every dollar. I have to work hard to raise this money to um, give these black and brown children the technology that they deserve and empower them while I'm doing this and let them know that there are people out here in the community that loves and cares for them. So my question is, is now I have an HP executive hitting me up talking about he wants to help. How do I keep it in my corner and not let them as the big company they are co-op the message that I'm trying to convey, which is, you know, I'm, I'm what they call a low income person. And I didn't raise $65,000 during a pandemic to give children their own laptops 
way better than a DOE is trying to do. So That's how right. do I keep the ball in my corner and not let the message that I'm working so hard to build for the children of New York City um, to keep it in, in our hands as the organizers, right. as a little nonprofit <laughs> organization made up of 10 Black parents that are doing this powerful work? Right. Well, well, first of all, first of all, the first thing to do is put in the chat the, <laughs> the, the, the GoFundMe and the or, name of the organization and your website. And everybody on this call, 177 of them, are going to donate today. And I'm going to be the first. As soon as I get <laughs> off, that's the first thing I'm going to do. Because that's important. Because you are absolutely right. You do not want HP coming in there trying to undermine this, this a beautiful, beautiful program. Um, so I, it's really imperative upon all of us to support the work because they, you know, you cannot, tr I mean, I'm sorry, you cannot trust corporations. We just had a big, you know, a, 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 my, my amazing comrade and friend, Brian Bain, who's here at UCLA and does amazing prison work, prison activism work. I remember Brian and I were in a conversation with UCLA um, uh, uh, development and they're like, so, you know, so Brian wanted to start a, a, a center for, for justice studies, right? A center for justice. Um, we have a connection with the Koch brothers who could give you all this money. And I'm like, man, really? Like, like, do you know who this man is? Do you know who I am? So we, so the fact is they can say, well, we don't, Koch brothers give you money in a second. Like, no, we refuse. So we have to refuse, but we, but, but again, we can't refuse and then have nobody else come out and support you. That's up to us. And by the way, I so appreciate what you're doing. Um, my friend Noliwe Rooks, you know, writes about education. I remember her talking about how, and we see, I saw this in LA, how for a lot of kids during the pandemic, um, you know, if you live in certain neighborhoods, you know, you don't have internet at your house, you got to go to McDonald's, right? So you sit at McDonald's trying to do your homework because you got the, the free internet, right? And then they're going to say, you've been there too long and throw you out or sitting on the curb, you know, to do your work. So these are terrible conditions. These are unacceptable. And all this like talk about technology is going to save us and free us. What it does is, is create or at least um, continue to create the, the, the kind of class and racial and gender divide that we're dealing with. Um, it's not the reason for it, but, but this technology is a product of the same capitalist system that has created these divides in the first place. So what should we expect? It's going to save us. So you're doing the work. So make sure you put, put that information in there. Uh, and everybody, I'm just, I'm asking everyone to donate. If we get, if 177 people donated $20, you know, you'd be doing pretty good. Oh, thank you. You've been doing pretty well. But thank you, Tanisha. I'm, I, when this pandemic's over, I'm coming to New York and with my people are there and I'm gonna visit you. We're gonna hang out. All right. Um, we have another question in the chat from Deshone um, who asks, can you speak a bit about the contradictions that exist within the welfare system, especially with respect to punitive practices and the guise of rehabilitation back into the mainstream capitalist society. How might we combat this in our divestment campaigns where short-term or subsistence is more gained than structural shifts? Oh, great question, great question. And there's a long history uh, of, of that. Um, uh, I think about, well, I'm about to rattle off a whole bunch of books, but I keep doing that, I should stop doing that. Um, there's a long history uh, to this in that the, what we think of as a kind of 20th century welfare system, um, which started out as aid to family with dependent children, um, the title is, is very important, uh, was always from the very get-go, especially when it became more uh, uh, associated with, not necessarily giving to, but associated with uh, uh, families of color. Uh, women of color, um, it becomes a means of social control and behavioral control. 
And so the welfare system has a long history of things like trying to, attempting to control reproduction, right? Um, uh, you know, in the, the, and it's tied to the carceral state in the use of certain kinds of mechanisms to, to provide, to um, control reproduction, to put certain limits on who can get aid. Um, and if you have children, you know, out of wedlock, there was all these, but of course people fought back. National Welfare Rights Organization fought back to change that. The National Welfare Rights Organization fought to, um, to try to change the way we understand um, these uh, uh, benefit transfers, right? As not a handout, but a right, right? Um, and then we take one step further where uh, uh, Margaret Prescott, who I talked about yesterday, uh, as, a, as a founding member of the International Black Women for Wages for Housework was insisting that we gotta think about uh, welfare not as a handout, but as a wage for unpaid work. Now, if we make one other leap, and that is go from the idea of transferring benefits, uh, go from the idea of using, well, replace uh, food stamps, the electronic benefits transfer system, these cards, which are used um, so allegedly or presumably to be used to buy uh, necessary items and groceries and things in, in lieu of food stamps, but it's also used to track people, to use as a form of surveillance, uh, to monitor people's behavior. Um, drug tests are used to monitor people's behavior, to basically remove them from receiving any kind of benefits. Um, you know, housing police, all these different things happen as a result, and certainly immigration laws. But to go back to this issue of, of social control, um, Margaret Prescott was saying, you know, we, we need to think about wages. The one step further is to say, eliminate welfare altogether, right? You don't need that. What you need is a guaranteed annual income, right? A basic income with no strings attached, with no, so, no um, attempts to try to change behavior or control people's lives. Um, and, and just simply say that there is a floor through which we cannot go, you know? Um, and so the whole struggle around welfare, welfare rights was about moving toward a guaranteed annual income. Um, and what it does is not only does it eliminate this kind of structural constraints that try to change people's uh, behaviors or monitor them or, or undermine their lives in some ways and invade their lives, but also eliminates the whole bureaucracy that's very costly, um, that's all intended to try to, you know, change people. Um, and so in some, it's, because it's, a, it's a very important uh, question about what to do, but we have to fight for guaranteed, uh, for basic income. Um, and we've got, and that tied to that is also fighting for a uh, living wage. A living wage is not $15 an hour, living wage is more than that. Um, but these are the things that are just basic, you know, that we have to, we have to keep fighting for. Um, we have to fight for affordable housing. All these things are, 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 are uh, connected and we've got to fight to end all forms of caging um, and these kinds of constraints to place on people, you know, because it, it's not only very expensive, but it also undermines our own humanity, our ability to reproduce ourselves as a community, as a people. All right, so I've got another question. And this one again comes from Ria. She's gone to the chat for this. So she says, when you talk about the example with McDonald's and students doing homework there, oftentimes stories like these are framed as feel good stories where one kind manager lets students stay and work daily. These feel good stories often lead to pacifying white middle-class readers rather than provoking outrage about the conditions that lead to needing an act of feel-good kindness in the first place. The same goes for stories about working overtime to support community programs and fundraising for underdeveloped initiatives. How can these narratives be reframed and pushed towards the mass of people who consume them and lead to outrage and change? Right. 
that that's so true about those stories. You know, um, my wife's an, uh, an an actress, and she was just reading a script that was like yet another one of these stories about these terrible schools, and then someone comes in and saves the children. Um, so, you know, how do you ref reframe those? I mean, the fact of the matter is that I think we do that all the time, all the time. The question is how do how do you make the reframing hegemonic? That, that to me is the question. I, mean, I think this reframing is going on constantly. I mean, you know, I would say that I could see a lot of people who are in this uh, conversation, are, that's what they do. They reframe the conversation. Um, they, they um, you know, because in the end, as you know, as implied in the question, the question, the question that they should all be asking is, why should anyone ever have to do their homework at McDonald's, period. Why should anyone um, have to live in a place where there's McDonald's? <laughs> no. I mean, there's all kinds of questions to ask, um, but if you believe that there are certain peoples, whether they're Black, Latinx, poor, indigenous, who are in that condition, not because of structural reasons, but because of bad choices their parents might have made or whatever, then all these instances will be perceived as feel good stories because what you see is people overcoming adversity, not overcoming structural racism and, and racial capitalism and patriarchy but overcoming adversity. And adversity is this thing that follows us, you know? And when you are able to do that, we all applaud, you know? Uh, and, and look, I have a, I have a biography uh, uh, that some people will take as like, oh, you know, single parent growing up in Harlem and now he's like a big time professor. But I give a talk, you know, that um, this, which is about sort of the origins of, of, of well, there's a talk that I've given before, which is really about the importance of, of you know, collective knowledge. And so I could take that same story and tell my story about the, the presence of Black Panther Party in Harlem, the presence of all these organizations and teachers and community organizers and activists and community spaces that have been um, defunded, uh, that have protect us. Uh, through sports, through after-school programs, through libraries, you know, that, that this, is, this is responsible for where I am. Those people, those communities, those federally and state and municipally funded institutions. I brag about the fact that I went to a university where the tuition was $90 a semester. Why was that? It's not because of me, you know, it's because we, you know, would not accept anything, you know, more than that, because we felt like there needed to be a social wage, a, 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 a kind of public life, you know, that we all can benefit from. And so to see it that way is to see that the adversity is produced by a system. And we've got to be able to see that system, but also see the alternative to it, to see what a public culture could actually produce for us. You know, to see what decent schools and decent education, not prisons, can do for us. When we see that, then, then that's the alternative, you know, and then we can move away from these narratives and produce a different vision of how we can be um, as, as a people, as a nation, as a world. All right. So the, the next question is some, and somewhat, it's somewhat related. So it's from Yubin who says she wants to ask about the object of the struggle many times like minimum wages, guaranteed income, et cetera, are decided by the state, yet the state is also doing the policing, co-opting, colonizing, extracting, et cetera. It's a big question, but how should we consider the US government? Right, that is a big question. And it's, a, it's an essential question. Um, and this goes back to when people think about what it means to make reforms in this whole debate about reformist reforms, versus those that are not. Um, and I think that to go back to like 
what I understand to be an abolitionist, perspe abolitionist perspective, you know, you can't make the leap to say, you know what, the state is bankrupt, the state. So what we need to do really is like forget all this other stuff and see state power. That's one kind of Marxist Leninist position or um, create alternative institutions and just ignore the state. You know, both of those things, as powerful as they might be, um, don't actually solve all the problems because A, there's some things that are immediate. People need a $15 minimum wage. I mean, I think it's not enough, but that doesn't mean you don't fight for it. And yes, the state provides that, but we live in a representative democracy that claims to be liberal. It's not really liberal. Um, it's not really democracy, it's anti-democracy, according to Cedric Robinson, and I think that's true. But even within an anti-democracy like the United States, one that determines presidential elections through electoral college, which is a holdover from slavery. I mean, even, even there, we're able to like win some local elections and get people in positions where some little things could be done. That's not the revolution, but little things could be done. Uh, we can get legislation passed that could at least in the short term, eliminate things like cash bail. Um, that doesn't solve all the problems. And sometimes some of those, some what replaces it could be really problematic, like use of algorithms, for example, to determine who's going to be able to get out and who's not. Um, but still, little things like that, it's not meant to be incremental. It's meant to be survival pending revolution, right? Things that can be done. And yet, there's still other things like creating institutions that are really outside the state, trying to be able to raise money for ourselves without having to depend on foundations or federal funds to do that. That matters, all that matters. It's not the revolution, but it matters in terms of our ability to maintain a certain kind of autonomy. Um, and also um, being able to turn to international institutions to, to defend and protect us. The United Nations is not perfect, but sometimes it's the place to go to talk about genocide, to talk about the lack of uh, water, um, to talk about the human rights violations in the United States. So all these fights have to be fought all the time, all the time, everywhere, and still with an understanding, with as you actually say, that we don't forget that the state you know, is our jailer, the state, is the one that determines ultimately some of the outcomes here. Um, but what we have are movements, what we have are people, and we can push the state to a certain limit and get some things that can make our movement and our people just a little bit stronger, a little bit better, you know, pending revolution, you know, pending something much bigger. Um, so I, I don't know if that answers the question, but that's sort of how I think about it. And all the people who taught me, um, that's what I learned, so. Well, we're at our ending time, but I still have other questions here. I don't know, do you wanna take one more or? Um, um, <laughs> I guess I'll, I'll, take, I'll take one more. I'm trying to be yeah. short. All right. So that was a good place to end, though. I thought <laughs> it was. It was. I mean, we can do that. I mean, no, it's it, okay. I'm just. I'm just joking. All right. So Naomi in, in the chat asks me, or to ask you, um, where do you see radical art in this struggle for justice? You've edited an anthology on surrealism. So do you see the creative arts as essential for radical change? Oh, no question. No question. In fact, um, without even having to answer the question. Um, I would I would direct you to if you haven't seen it, the whole series of um, talks and conversations on and I'm blanking out on the actual exact title, but it's basically um, on uh, art and abolition. It's uh, out of UC Santa Cruz. Uh, Gina Dent um, is one of the main people organizing. It's a whole bunch of talks and conversations, visualizing abolition. Thank you so much. Yes, that's what it's called, visualizing abolition. It's beautiful. Um, and so that's a space where that's what the conversation is about. And in terms of trying to answer the question, I mean, art does so many things, but the most important thing it does, you know, 
Art could be seen as re reportage. Art could be seen as revealing truths. Um, but for me, radical art is, does two really important things. One, ask the questions that are hard to ask in any other way about who we are, um, what we're dealing with. Um, but also the second thing is to reveal what's possible for which there are no words. You know, we spend, and, and, and I say no, no words, sometimes words could be the, the way to do it, but those words may not take the form of the essay or the book. It may take the form of the poetic. It may take the form of the visual. It could take the form of performance. It could take the form of, you know, in other words, the, the imagination is, is, you know, only as limiting as the language that we have available to us to articulate and make it, make it, you know, present to, 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 to animate it. And so radical art is a way to break out of language, you know, which doesn't always tell us everything. I teach a class right now on jazz and the political imagination. In fact, I got to have my office hours in, uh, in about half an hour about the, with that class. And so much we talk about, we talk about music. We listen to music that actually moves you. I mean, you know, to listen to John Coltrane uh, and Alice Coltrane uh, perform uh, Reverend King is something that's transformative, right? So yes, it's really essential, um, but we also have to remember that sometimes the most radical art is the art that doesn't make us feel good, but makes us really uncomfortable, makes us really question everything, makes us, you know, wonder about things. And that's what radical art does as well, you know? Um, and lastly, um, we always have to ask the question, what is art in the first place? And I have to say, there's aspects of art making that, you know, involve community, collectivities, you know, more than the individual uh, in her imagination or their imagination. And that work is also not only revelatory and beautiful, but it is about a process, you know? Um, I think about the way that, um, uh, you know, murals were being made and created uh, by collectives and what they left behind in telling stories. Um, I think about the art of, of dance. And I think about my uh, former student, Chamel Bell, for example, who does this amazing work in terms of street dance activism. I mean, that's radical art, that's radical art that is uh, participatory, uh, that is engaging, that takes up space, that disrupts um, the, the world as we know it, disrupts life as usual. Um, and finally, just activism itself, organizing, being in the streets, there's something artistic about that work. There's something uh, creative and radical about what slogans we bring to, to bear, what signs we bring, what ways do we use our bodies to disrupt, you know, um, business as usual? That's art, you know. Um, and if we don't think of it as art, we'll never be able to imagine new strategies and new act, new tactics to um, create the new world we're trying to create. 